Hi, this is Tom Soan, and I've just done a discovery call with a landlord who's got one property that's rented out at the moment. He's had it since about 2006 or 2007, and it's built up a nice bit of equity because it's grown in value. He's been making some profit from the rent as well. So now he wants to buy his second property investment um, in order to grow that portfolio. And so we talked through a number of different things and I wanted to share that conversation with you because there were some points in there, like for example, we talked about minimizing risk, how to take as little risk as possible, what sorts of properties to buy, what sorts of property investments to make um, in order to minimize the risk. But also we talked about buying the property in a limited company rather than a personal name and what the, the things that he would need to do in order to get to the level where he can invest in property as a limited company, what he would need to do for that. But also we talked about locations and how to find those areas where they're good for property investment deals and you can find the right properties for the right tenants with the right income and the right yield and so on. So yeah, it was just a good conversation, which I think you might be able to take some tips or some advice from um, to help you in your situation. Maybe you're trying to invest in property yourself. Maybe you've got one now and you want to buy more. Maybe you're just starting out. I just thought it'd be a really good way to to help as many people as I can by sharing those conversations. So first of all, yeah, we talked about risk. Now, the guy I was talking to is very risk averse, meaning he doesn't want to take high risk to make more profit. And actually, there are so many people like that that want to make profit. Of course you do, because that's what you're investing for, but don't really want to make high risk investments to make loads of profit. Like me, you're happier making a bit less profit, but with far less risk. And generally speaking, it's not 100% of the time, but generally speaking, the higher the profit, the higher the risk. And that's the way that you should look at it. If you want to make more profit, that's great, but you're going to take higher risk in order to do it. And that might mean that you, you take higher risk in having empty properties or bad tenants or maintenance, repairs, refurbishments, renovations, all of those sorts of things. It might mean that you have to cope with more legislation. It's going to take you more time to deal with this property. But that is balanced by making more profit. And you can go for those higher risk properties. But this guy was looking for more uh, low risk, good profit, low risk type properties. So I suggested maybe he should look at single lets and ignore HMOs, ignore student lets, ignore uh, serviced accommodation or holiday lets so that he can just get a two or three bedroom house, something like that, that rents out reliably, has always got a high demand and rents out very securely to maybe small families, professionals or maybe larger families. Um, and that's a very, in my opinion anyway, that's a very safe and secure investment. Now, no investments are risk-free. Of course they're not. You could get the most loveliest family on the planet move into your property. But unfortunately, circumstances happen to everybody and everybody could have something happen to them at any time. And that's the risk you take as a property investor, isn't it? But what you need to look at is the odds. So actually the odds of having a problem on a two or three bedroom house are probably going to be less than having a problem with a serviced accommodation property or a house of multiple occupancy or a student a student property, something like that. It's probably a, a lower risk of having serious issues. So we talked a bit about that. And, and like I say, I suggested he could maybe go for a two or three bed house. We talked through the types of tenants you could hope to attract. Um, and we also talked through the sorts of yield that you could expect to achieve from, from a single let like that. Um, and by the way, a single let is just a property which rents as one contract rather than a house of multiple occupancy or a HMO would be multiple tenancies within one property. Student lets can also be the same. Serviced accommodation is a completely different thing altogether. So when I use the term single let, it just means a straightforward buy to let, something like that. So we also talked about buying that property, the second property as a limited company, which it seems to be uh, more profitable if you do it correctly, 
because you can get more tax benefits um, than buying the property in a personal name. Now, that doesn't mean you should never buy a property in a personal name because actually it just means different things to different people. So you definitely do need to speak to a tax advisor or your accountant who will be able to tell you what's best for your situation. But for me, we talked. To, he said he wanted to invest the next one uh, in the next property as a limited company. So we talked through a few things that I think is important to know. And just like starting any company, you're not going to be able to start a company today and then tomorrow go and approach the mortgage lenders and get funding. It doesn't quite work like that. You have to build up some credibility in that company, like a credit rating, if you like. Build up the credit rating and the credibility um, and the investability in that company before you can just use that company solely on its own for borrowing money from lenders. So what you'll need to do most most, most of the time is um, go to a lender and borrow the money through the limited company, but give the lender a personal guarantee from you in order to get that lender to approve the mortgage deal. Um, especially if you are the sole director, probably the same too if you've got a couple of directors. But if you're going to buy a property as a limited company, it's a brand new company, then the lender is probably going to want to have a personal guarantee from you to guarantee those mortgage payments, which means you are liable for that mortgage. Now, that kind of defeats the object of having a limited liability company, right? Because the reason you would have a limited liability company is to, is all, believe it or not, is in order to limit the liability on you personally. However, if you're starting a company, you've got to, you've got to grow that reputation, the credibility of a company. See, now, for example, I don't have to give personal guarantees anymore because I've built up a credibility, I've built up a track record, I've paid my mortgage payments on time through the limited company. So now the mortgage lenders recognize the limited company as a reliable investment. And that's what they're doing. They're investing in you. Now, if I wanted to start up a limited company, I would just go to Company Formations 24-7. It costs about 20 quid, takes about 10 minutes, and it's easy as that. You don't need to go for any expensive packages unless you really want to. 20 quid will do it, and it takes it's so quick and so easy. Um, but also it's worth speaking to an accountant about that too. They can definitely help you with the <clears throat> definitely help you with the setup of that company too. So the other thing we spoke about a little bit was locations. And locations play such a huge part in investing in property. Because, well, first of all, this guy that I spoke to on, on this discovery call, he uh, lives in, in Kent. So he wanted to invest in his next property around an area which was a bit closer to home, which I can totally understand. His current property is over near Portsmouth, so it's you know a good old two-hour distance um, from one to the other. Um, but location is really important for a number of reasons. First of all, if you find a property investment that's local to you, you probably instinctively know if it's a good property area or a good tenant area or it's going to attract the right people for you. And I, I notice I said for you, it's important, I think, as a, as a landlord to get the right investment, not just the property, but also the tenant too. So you'll know what locations attract the types of people that you want. Now, sometimes you'll pay a bit more for the locations that will provide you with a comforting tenant, so to speak. But that's the point. If you're going to lower your risk, you also need to lower your stress. There's no point making profit from property if you're too stressed all the time to enjoy it, right? So location is really important in that sense. Of course it is. But also you want to have a look at areas where there's perhaps lower crime rates. Perhaps you can have a look at the um, the type of demand in that area as well. And you can do that by looking at right move. For an example, just do a search in that area for all the properties that are on the market in right move, then go into the filters, select let, or you can also do the same from a sales perspective too. It kind of gives you the same picture. And then if, for example, there are 30 properties on the market, but 30 properties have been let, 
then you know there's a decent demand in that area. And that's the thing you're looking for. You're looking to increase your demand in the right locations that give you the right um, confidence in your property investment so that you're not just constantly worried that your next tenant's going to be really bad and uh, you're going to buy a property in a flood area and all those sorts of things. So yeah, these are the sorts of things we went through. And what we wrapped it up by basically saying that um, if you're going to buy it as a limited company, then definitely be prepared to put some personal guarantees to the first couple of years of purchasing properties as a limited company. But also when you're choosing a location to invest in, make sure it fits with you. Now, when you become a bit more of an experienced, prolific property investor, you might start branching further afield. You might start looking at other areas and start speaking to more and more people in the industry. That's fine. But if you're looking to keep it um, as low key and as, as low risk as possible, it might be worth looking in your local area. Um, and then lastly, we were talking about the risk side of things and minimizing that risk. Well, like I said at the beginning of this, the higher the profit, the higher the risk. That's generally speaking. If you're going to invest in property and you don't mind taking risk to make a little bit more property, go for it. There's nothing to stop you as long as you do it correctly. And that starts at the beginning. If you're going to buy a high risk property, why is it high risk? What are those risks and how do those risks translate into actual money? And here's a really good way to think about that. If you've got a property which is low risk, for an example, you could calculate into your forecasts that once every three years, you were going to miss a rent payment, meaning you weren't going to receive rent for one month in every three years. Now, that could be because one tenant moves out and the other tenant's moving in and there's a, a void in the middle. It could be that each three years, your tenant misses a payment because they have financial difficulties. It could be anything. But if you forecast for that, you know it's going to happen. The next thing to, for, to forecast for is if you're going to ever have to evict a tenant, then it might take you eight months to do it. Once you've been through all the notice periods and you've been through the court process and the eviction process, it might take you eight months to get rid of that tenant. And during that eight months, you're still going to have to pay your mortgage payments. You're still going to have to pay your insurance payments. You're still going to have to pay management fees and maintenance costs and all those sorts of things. So work out as a worst case scenario what that could cost you. And if that figure is six grand, then start saving up the rent profit until you've reached that buffer period. Now, you can still get that money back, right? If your tenant costs you that amount of money by not paying rent, then you can still get that rent back because you might, you should have the right insurances in place, first of all, but also you should be able to claim that money back through the courts as well. So yes, you're uh, mitigating, if you like, against your risk, and you are protecting yourself from uh, loss of cash flow, but you are also able to get that back, replenish that cash pot, and then move on to the next tenant. So hopefully those things help. Um, and uh, if you've got any questions about that sort of stuff, just give me a shout. You can contact me through my Facebook page or you can email me, whichever's easiest, tom at pinkstreet.co.uk. Um, or if you want a discovery call for yourself, you're kind of getting, hopefully anyway, you're kind of getting a grasp for what sort of things that can be discussed. I'll try and help as many people as I can. And uh, hopefully you can grab some advice from this um, and some tips on how you can improve yourself as a property investor. But that's it. And I hope everybody grasped all of that. And I will speak to you all later. Take care. Bye.